With Wrath of the Lich King on the horizon and high-priced items available for purchase in Wrath, you're probably wondering what the best ways to make gold are in Wrath. There is an incredible amount of high-priced items in Wrath, such as the Traveler's Tundra Mammoth, which costs 20,000 gold, along with all the Argent Tournament mounts, which add up to another 2,500 gold, and May Francis in Dalaran has even more mounts, which add up to another 3,500 gold gold. The Mechgineer's Chopper will cost anywhere from 10,000 to 15,000 to craft too. And this is just if you're collecting mounts. There's Cold Weather Flying for 1,000 gold. The Dalaran Teleport Ring is really handy and that's 8,000 gold. Dual Spec is 1,000 gold. Harris Pilton sells a bag called the Portable Hole, which is a 24 slot bag for 3,000 gold. And if you want to power level up your professions, that's going to be super expensive. So with all that said, you'll need to find a few reliable ways to generate gold consistently throughout Wrath of the Lich King, and my goal with this video is to give you a huge list of farming methods for you to take a look at, you know, listen to, and choose the ones that sound the most fun to you. And if you like the video, don't forget to give it a like and a subscribe to the channel so you don't miss the next one. First up, Coming in at number 17, we have skinning. Now, any time I make a new character and I plan on just leveling and avoiding professions, I always just get skinning anyways because it's free extra gold while you level because while you're leveling, you're gonna end up killing beasts at some point. And skinning in Wrath, like in vanilla and TBC, it just integrates with what you're already doing. So for that reason, you know, I think a lot of people know this and choose skinning as a profession, even if they're just trying to get to max level as fast as they can. But since so many people are going to go skinning, that usually drives down the price of leather on the auction house. It's simple supply and demand, right? So in some cases, you know, it, it might just be better to vendor the leather that you're getting from skinning while you're leveling. But this is not always the case. So, you know, compare the vendor price to auction house price before you make any moves. Now, I, I recommend some add-ons for this. I love TSM, that stands for Trade Skill Master, and there's also an add-on called Vendor Price, so you know exactly how much things are going to sell for. On a fresh server, you'll probably be vendoring it in my opinion, but on an established high population server where there's probably some level of inflation, you'll probably make more on the auction house. Now speaking of vendoring, I also recommend the Pawn add-on. It'll show you item upgrades, but more importantly for gold making if none of the items that are rewarded from a quest are an upgrade it will immediately show you which item will vendor for the most gold so that actually saves you time looking at the different vendor prices mousing them over so you can just immediately pick that item that sells for the most and I also recommend the Leatrix add-on. It will automatically sell all vendor trash in your bags. That's the gray quality items. They have no purpose. And it just sells them all in, like automatically. It's really cool. And in my opinion, makes WoW even more addicting. Just seeing that all auto sell. And it gives you a summary of how much gold you made from vendor trash. So it's really, really cool. All right, coming up at number 16 is common items while leveling. Now, if you do get Leatrix, there will be a bunch of items that are white rarity, which is also known officially as common rarity, in your inventory after the vendor trash uh, auto sells. And you just look at it and you're like, what even is this thing? And you know, most people probably just vendor them, right? But some items like specifically northern items like ice web spider silk for example it drops off mobs and can actually sell for way way more than the vendor price and there are a bunch of them the dark water clam which you'll find will open up and yield succulent clam meat north sea pearls even sirens tears and these are actually super valuable for putting on the auction house you'll also inevitably find scrolls of strength or really any stat and this is going to be more valuable on the auction house than to a vendor. 
You'll also run into things that are quite obvious, like the runic mana or healing potions. You can also list those on the auction house while you level. And you're also bound to run into crystallized life or any of the other crystallized elements. These are the exact same as moats back in TBC, so hang on to them. They're worth a lot. Crystallized fire, earth, air, water, shadow, and so on are all used to turn into their eternal counterpart, which is the equivalent of a primal from TBC. So don't sell these common items, mail them back to a bank alt and list them on the auction house to make some much better gold than if uh, you were to vendor it. Okay, coming up next at 15 is questing at max level, which is level 80. Quests will give you extra gold instead of experience points when you're at max level. For fresh realms, this would be a great method for making gold. Some of the other methods will make you more gold faster, but it might be more mind numbing because with with questing it can be more fun because you know you're you're doing quests they give you some direction some lore and it could be a good change of pace from just mindlessly farming the same exact mob for example the calculation for wrath is experience given by the quest multiplied by six and that's how much copper you will get from the experience uh, you would have gotten so if a quest for example would give you something like 22,000 experience instead you'll get around 13 gold Gold. So this method can yield thousands of gold if you do the quests in areas where the quests are near max level. Places like Storm Peaks or Ice Crown uh, are definitely some good choices. All right, coming in at number 14, we have daily quests. Now you can find a lot of daily quests in Northrend. There's a bunch in Storm Peaks with the Sons of Hodir, the dailies at Brunhildar Village. There's also the Oracles in Sholazar Basin. Ice Crown with the Argent Tournament, and of course, Profession Daily Quests, and so many more. These will get a bit mind numbingly boring because, you know, they're the same quests over and over every single day, but they are a good source of consistent gold. Some more dailies include Battleground Dailies, Cooking Dailies, Fishing Dailies. There's also Dungeon Dailies and Heroic Dailies, which, by the way, were in fact removed in Patch 330 because of Dungeon Finder. They actually were removed in place of Dungeon Finder, but since we know that we will not be getting Dungeon Finder in classic Wrath of the Lich King, you can expect that these dailies will be in the game when Wrath Classic launches. There's also three new World PvP dailies now available at Venture Bay. This is the equivalent of something like Broken Hill or the Overlook in Hellfire. The faction in control of Venture Bay will also get access to a fourth PvP daily quest and an NPC which you can buy gear with with honor points from, so there's some incentive to control Venture Bay. Let's also not forget these seasonal dailies like Brewfest, Hollow's End, and Midsummer Fire Festival. You'll actually really want to do these, in my opinion, each season, because if you do, you'll be rewarded with the Violet Proto Drake from the achievement What a, Str uh, what a Long Strange Trip It's Been. This is one of the few mounts in Wrath that moves at 310% flying speed. Now, like in TBC, Wrath has a lot of dailies, and you're going to get a decent amount of gold per daily. It's not the fastest method in the world, but it's an easy one to check off your list each day. Okay, coming in at number 13, we have Spellweave, Moonshroud, and Ebonweave. If you're a tailor, you can craft these special cloths which are used in endgame recipes. Each of these will go for anywhere from 40 to 200 gold or more, depending on your server's supply and demand. Now, crafting it is on a four-day cooldown, which is a big reason why these items are valuable. They're going to be scarce. However, because of the cooldown, this isn't a super great gold-making strategy because it can't be masked, it can't be farmed, it's time gated, right? But it is another stream of gold for you every so often. So if you're tailor and you don't want to forget to craft them each chance you get, since it's a good source of gold, you know, I recommend maybe mark your calendar, put a reminder, you know, a timer somewhere, uh, just so you don't forget. And it's also much easier to craft these in Wrath compared to the TBC version. For one, it's only one type of Eternal per cloth instead of multiple, and you can make them all in the same zone, which is Dragon Blight. TBC had you running around to Shadow Moon Valley, then all the way to Nether Storm, and then you gotta go find a Moonwell. So it was definitely not as convenient as it is now in Wrath of the Lich King, so you should definitely do this if you're a tailor. All right, coming in at number 12 is Frostweave Bags. So this is another tailoring gold maker method but everyone needs decent bags and people will definitely have multiple
multiple characters in Wrath. These 20 slot bags aren't super hard to make, but they are a bit harder than the entry level TBC bag was to make. These are going to require imbued nether weave bolts, which require infinite dust. But with it being harder to make, it will definitely go for more than the nether weave bags went for. I predict somewhere between maybe 60 to maybe 80 gold a pop, since it's the cheapest Wrath of Lich King bag to buy for the amount of slots you get. Now, you might think, wow, it's a lot of gold, but each expansion, gold, it gets inflated, it becomes easier to come by, so it might sound like a lot, but these bags are pretty economic. Depending on the supply and demand of your server, those prices, of course, will vary, and more often than not, they'll probably be an oversupply, so the price will maybe even be on the cheaper side. But still, most people will be buying these so you can net some profit, especially since Wrath is the expansion with heirlooms. So there will be a ton of incentive for players to level multiple characters. And with multiple characters, you're going to have to get those bags. So you can definitely capitalize at, on that by supplying all their bags. Okay, number 11, we have prospecting and cutting gems. Now, gems are needed for putting into gear with sockets, and you can make a lot of money as a jewel crafter by just buying gems off the auction house, cutting them, and then relisting them. And I really mean that because getting the recipes for certain gems involves doing dailies, and the only way you can get those recipes for those cuts is by purchasing them from Dalaran with Dalaran Jewel Crafters tokens, which is either from dailies or uh, Titan Steel Dust. So, um, you know, especially early on in the expansion, certain cuts will be super lucrative. And not only is it lucrative, but it's also pretty easy to do. Um, so you know, definitely check it out. Look for look for deals where it makes sense, where you can buy low and sell high, and really take advantage of your jewel crafting skill. And if the price is right, you can also just buy Saranite ore and prospect it, cut the gems or craft gear with them, or even transmute the uncut gems into meta gems if you're also an alchemist, and make a boatload of gold. This process it, this process is so famous that it has a name called. Uh, the Saranite Shuffle, which involves doing this process that I kind of just went went through with Saranite Ore. So, jewel crafting is super lucrative in Wrath of the Lich King. Okay, moving on to number 10, we have Farming Old Dungeons. This is kind of a niche one, but there are quite a few items from Vanilla and TBC that will definitely still be valuable in Wrath because people will be leveling professions, alts, etc. You can disenchant blues or epics. There's tons of rune cloth to be farmed, nether weave to be farmed. But that cloth you can sell directly on the auction house. Disenchanting the blues and greens will also yield enchanting materials. And enchanting materials will definitely definitely go for a lot more than you remember because in Wrath of the Lich King Classic the disenchant button next to needing greed is not going to exist because there's no random dungeon finder and there's no uh you know that was that that uh, addition was added with random dungeon finder so there will be way less supply of enchanting materials than before now on top of that with vellums added to the game right from in, uh, um, from scribes inscription enchanters can now list their enchants and that's going to increase the demand for enchanting materials even if the actual demand for an enchanting isn't as high because the enchanters are just going to keep listing you know lots of enchants and and so uh, there's going to be a little bit of a disconnect between the actual demand for enchants and how much uh, enchanting materials will be purchased so uh, definitely if you're an enchanter uh, you'll probably have a big opportunity to make a lot of gold selling enchanting materials Okay, coming in at number nine, we have BOE Epics. Wrath of the Lich King added a ton of high quality craftable items. Most of these require the crafter to have either a Crusader's Orb, a Ruined Orb, or a Frozen Orb, which are acquired from Trial of the Crusader, Olduar, or Heroics, respectively. Now, think of Frozen Orbs as the next Primal Nethers, and Ruined Orbs or crusader orbs as nether vortices but changing by raid tier so in addition to these scarce reagents you'll also need to have the recipes themselves which can be learned from either the trainer their purchase or even world drops and there really are a ton like even just a few examples are like leggings of woven death leg plates of painful death belt of the titans titanium spike guards lunar eclipse robes rock steady treads i mean i could list off so many 
There are also BOE epics that drop that are high value like Woden's Lucky Necklace, Harbringer's Bone Band, or even Ring of Rotting Sinew. So BOE epics, it's a different type of farming strategy. You're going to basically make a lot of money from a single purchase, uh, but you're probably not going to have as many purchases, right? Okay, coming in at number eight, we have Moat Extractor Farming. Now, you need to be an engineer for this one, but you can make a lot of gold using this method, especially if you are uncontested. The crystallized elements are extracted from clouds in various locations in Northrend. Arctic clouds, which can be found in Howling Fjord, Dragon Blight, and the Storm Peaks, will supply crystallized air and water. The cinder clouds, which can be found in the Savage Thicket, if you remember that's on fire, and Shola's our basin, the obsidian dragon shrine in dragon blight, and the cauldron of flames in winter grasp. These are all going to yield a crystallized fire. And there's also steam clouds. These can be found around the geyser fields and scalding pools within Berean tundra and throughout Sholazar basin, which produce crystallized fire and crystallized water. So that's really, really cool. And what's really cool on top of that is that in Wrath, the Moat Extractor now provides tracking for get for gas clouds just by being in your inventory. And that was actually removed from the engineering goggles, which is a nice quality of life change for those doing Moat Extractor farming. Now this farming method I wouldn't uh, you know, recommend unless you have an epic flying mount and cold weather flying. So if your goal is to make enough gold to buy your epic flyer, then I wouldn't recommend this method for you. I would uh, recommend choosing one of the other methods. But because this method is best for people with epic flying, that means it's more exclusive and therefore less competitive. And if you have an epic flyer, definitely check this one out to make more gold. Okay, coming in at number seven, we have herbalism. Now, lots Lots of herbs sell for a lot in Wrath. Frost Lotus is one of the most valuable of the herbs. It spawns along the shorelines of the lakes in Wintergrasp within Ulduar's Conservatory of Life, and it also has a small chance of dropping when you gather other herbs in Northrend. It's essential for many recipes across many professions such as alchemy and tailoring. You can also find crystallized life when you gather herbs, which is the equivalent of motes of life from TB which you can combine to create eternal life, which really isn't as easy to farm as the other eternals, so herbalism has a leg up on everyone else. There's also other herbs like Ice Thorn, Lich Bloom, Adder's Tongue, Talandra's Rose, and Tiger Lilies. These are all herbs that are found within Northrend, and you can bet they will be in high demand because of Inscription, the new profession in Wrath, which requires herbs in order to create pigments, which involves milling the herbs actually right with like a mortar and pestle destroys them and it's basically like prospecting with jewel crafting so if you pick up herbalism make sure to grab these herbs and list them on the auction house for some massive profits there i think that's going to do very very well all right, coming in at number six, we have mining. Like herbalism, ore and bars are going to sell for a bunch in Wrath of the Lich King. You've got titanium bars, sarnite bars, sarnite ore, titanium ore, and then you got cobalt bars and ore. Pretty much all of these will go for a really good price. Like in TBC, you can also find crystallized elements when you mine, which can be super valuable if you get enough of them to turn into an internal, which again is the equivalent of a primal in Wrath. Now, what's really cool about mining is you can actually find every single type of crystallized element too. So mining is quite good in Wrath. Yet another added bonus with mining is that you can also sell the gems you find from mining, such as Scarlet Ruby, Autumn's Glow, Sky Sapphire, Twilight Opal, Monarch Topaz, and Forest Emerald. Aren't the names of these gems just beautiful? I absolutely love it. It just makes me want to play Wrath right now. These uncut gems are, are really valuable, and even more so, once again, if you're a jewel crafter, and you can then craft them into cut gems that can be inserted, inserted into gear. And what's even more great about mining is that these reagents are used for many, many professions like blacksmithing, engineering, and jewel crafting, three whole professions. So mining is definitely a fantastic profession for making gold in Wrath of the Lich King. Okay, moving on to number five, we have fishing and cooking. Now this gold making method, once again, is really 
really overlooked often because you know the time commitment needed in order to level fishing and cooking along with the you know i would say somewhat boring nature of fishing but there's actually a ton of high value items that come from fishing and cooking you know these include the dragon fin angelfish for dragon fin fillet there's the fang tooth herring which is used for the spicy fried herring you can even fish up crystallized water 10 of which can be combined to create an eternal water. A new addition to Wrath is feasts, which allow you to place down a meal like a mage table or a soul well, which anyone in your party or raid can click on, and then they're going to gain a well-fed buff. So now you can basically cover for your lazy teammates who forgot to bring consumes. One such feast is called Gigantic Feast, which requires a deep sea monster belly, rockfin grouper, and chunk o mammoth. There's also the Fish Feast, which will be very popular since it's the best in slot feast. This offers 80 attack power, 46 spell power, and 40 stamina, and it's made from nettle fish, glacial salmon, and muscleback sculpin. Definitely lots of options for making gold with fishing and cooking. Many people overlook it. Don't be one of them. Check it out. You'll be pleasantly surprised. All right, coming in at number four, we have Arctic Fur, Heavy Berean Leather, Icy Dragon Scales, Nubian Chitin, and Jormungar Scales. Now, these materials are all super valuable for crafting best-in-slot leg armors, and also the Arctic Furs are used as currency to purchase epic recipes within Dalarond. Dalaran. Also, heavy Berean leather is also used as currency to purchase the Icy and Polar set, which if you remember from vanilla, these are the sets which have frost resistance to help with Nexramas. So if you have skinning, make sure sell your Arctic fur on the auction house for huge profit. By the way, the recipes are BOP, bind on pickup, so you're going to want to sell the Arctic fur rather than buying the recipes unless you're a leather worker. Now, Arctic fur has a 1% chance to be found when you skin any B in Northrend. There are, of course, other leathers that are still valuable, so while you're skinning, definitely make sure to list the Northrend, le Northrend leathers you skin on the auction house. As always, your mileage may vary depending on your server's prices. All right, coming in at number three, we have Frosthide Leg Armor and Ice Scale Leg Armor. Now, Frosthide Leg Armor is the best in slot pant enchantment for tanks, and Ice Scale Leg Armor is the best in slot pant enchantment for physical damage dealing DPS classes like rogues, hunters, warriors, feral druids, and so on. This leg enchantment will go for hundreds of gold on the auction house, so if you are gathering icy dragon scales or an Arubian chitin as a skinner, then having leather working to craft these will seamlessly tie together your professions. To make the frost hide leg armor, you'll need two arctic fur, two Nerubian chitin, and one frozen orb. Now, frozen orbs will drop 100% of the time off the last boss of a heroic version of a dungeon. You don't always win the frozen orb, of course, so getting them can be a bit tricky. Sometimes if you're a tank, you know, you can reserve these beforehand, you know, if tanks are in high demand, so keep that in mind if you want to pursue this gold making strategy. Okay, coming in at number two is a big moneymaker. We have flasks, elixirs, and transmutes. Now, alchemy has a bunch of flasks, flasks, elixirs, and transmutes that people are willing to pay top gold for. There's the flask of the frostworm, flask of endless rage, flask of pure mojo, flask of stone blood. There's also elixir of might mighty agility sorry elixir yeah elixir of mighty agility elixir of mighty strength there's also transmute eternal might which will be a big money maker there there's also transmuting meta gems like sky flip like sky flare diamond earth siege diamond you can also transmute epic gems and so on there are lots and lots of alchemical flasks elixirs and transmutes that are very valuable making alchemy a huge huge money making profession especially when combined with jewel crafting to provide a source of gems for transmutes 
All right, coming in at number one, we have Eternals farming. Like Primals in TBC, Eternals will be high value because they are used in so many different recipes across so many different professions. The equivalent of the Elemental Plateau in TBC is Winter Grasp. It has every Eternal available, like the Elemental Plateau, but with that, it will be the most contested too for that reason. But your faction also has to own Winter Grasp. Eternal Shadow can be found from Shadow Revenants and Wandering Shadows when your faction owns Winter Grasp. These have excellent drop rates and you'll find a ton of Crystallized Shadow from the Shadow Revenants. The Wandering Shadows have a much lower drop rate, but still good. You could also farm Deathbringer Revenants, which can be found in the Frostmourne Cavern in Dragonblight, and is considered a less effective area because their drop rate is less than the Wandering Shadows. Eternal Life can best be gathered from Herbalism, but the next best way is from Living Lashers in Wintergrasp or the Mossy Rampagers, which can be which can be found around Zuldrak. The drop rates aren't great for either of these mobs, and if both spots are over farmed, you can also go to Shola's our basin to farm the lashers but there's not a whole lot of lasher mob density there so you know it could be a good farm if you're also a skinner though and want to skin the alligators and cro and cobras which are also found there now when it comes to eternal water it's much easier to get than life you can get these from fishing and mining cobalt and titanium nodes if you're not a fisher nor a miner you can also get these from water revenants and glacial spirits in winter grasp icebound revenants in the center of storm peaks within the frigid tomb is another good farming spot the aqueous spirits on storm rights shelf in sholazar basin is also great for farming crystallized air in addition to crystallized water on top of all that, slaying the elementals is actually also for daily quests for the oracles and frenzy heart, which are located in Sholazar Basin. So it's a good daily farm to get to do and uh, build it into your gold gathering routine because you're basically going to be getting crystallized um, air and water and getting a daily done at the same time. So that's a, that's a good tip for you right there. Eternal air can be found in winter grasp from the tempest revenants and whispering winds, like we mentioned just a second ago. So those storm revenants in Sholazar are great for eternal air. And then there's also the scions of storm in the howling hollow within storm peaks, which have a good drop rate if all other spots are contested. When it comes to eternal fire, this can be found from the flame revenants and raging flames within winter grasp. Storm peaks also has wailing winds within the frost flow deep and the seething revenants at Fjorn's anvil are two more spots within the same zone if you're trying to find a spot without competition. And last, we have Eternal Earth. Once again, you can find this within Winter Grasp. Alternatively, you can find Brittle Revenants at Frostfield Lake in Storm Peaks near Dun Nifilem. There's also a Sons of Hodir daily quest, which involves killing them, so might as well get two birds stoned for a rock. Lifeblood Elementals in Sholazar Basin around the Lifeblood Pillar is also another good farming spot, but the drop rate is a bit low. Um, but there are a lot of mobs. The mob density is quite high, so you could AoE farm this spot if you're someone like a mage, paladin, or even an unholy death knight. And that's it. Don't forget to like this video and subscribe. Thanks.